Now can everybody hear me? <laughs> Do I need to repeat or did you all hear that? Okay. All right. Yeah. My husband says I have a loud voice, so. <laughs> um, so like I said, um, uh, we have the mask covered. We have, if you don't feel good, we do encourage uh, that you do stay home. And we will be showing a video um, regarding human, tra human trafficking. Human trafficking includes labor and sex trafficking. While many would like to believe this crime does not occur in our communities, it does. Human trafficking, especially sex trafficking, is occurring in the state of Oregon and here in Lane County, here in Eugene. Human trafficking is the use of force, fraud, coercion to compel a person into any legal or illegal form of work or service against their will. Trafficking is a process, it's not an event. The trafficker's primary goal is control. It starts with a trafficker focusing on a target, which would be the victim. They will use courtship to gain trust with them. Then they strategically isolate that person from anything familiar to them. Eventually, they transition the victim into prostitution. And by this point, the trafficker has such control over their mind and body usually by physical force, abuse, has been involved by now, all of that has been involved by now, so this is a process, that the victim will do anything to survive, anything, including going out on the streets and selling themselves to make the money to bring back to the traffickers that they demand. Effects of trafficking. Sex trafficking is evil and will not have any positive effect on the victims who are exploited. Same thing with their families that go through it and their communities. Human trafficking is a money-making machine using human beings. This month, January, is National Human Trafficking Prevention Month. Every year since 2010, the president had ded has dedicated the month to raise awareness about human trafficking and to educate the public about how to identify and prevent this crime. The color blue, I have a blue ribbon and I have a blue pin, anything blue for the month of January is internationally recognized as the universal color for human trafficking prevention. We have out on the table, I have blue pins. Please, blue little ribbons, please feel free to take one or two or three for people that you know. We have handouts out there. Please learn more about what human trafficking, sex trafficking, labor trafficking, please, please lose, use, do the research and learn more about how can we, as a community, help prevent this? We will not be able to stop it. We cannot stop it. It goes so deep and so dark. But we can do everything we can to bring awareness to it and give hope to these survivors and these victims. Hold on. Not yet. <laughs> we do have packets out there. If you could please grab one. I have... We have upcoming events that Hope Ranch is um, hosting. Are in the, they will be here at Living Hope. We have an event coming up very, very soon. You are not alone. This is a survivor speak out event. And this will be happening here. And that's on the 21st. All this information is out there uh, for you to grab. There's also a little bit of information on how teens become victims, can become victims. So there's a lot of information um, that is free to everyone. So I just encourage that, and if we will go ahead and play the video. Human trafficking is slavery. And it happens all over America. Any child, any woman, any man could potentially become a victim of human trafficking. I am a victim of labor trafficking. I was a victim of child sex trafficking. 
but now I own my body. Human trafficking is any kind of forced labor. It can happen to anybody. I am a mother. I am an author. I am a son. I'm an advocate. I am an educator. I'm a sister. I am a brother. I'm so much more than what happened to me. I am strong. I am brave. I am outspoken. I am compassionate. I am a survivor. 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 I am a survivor of human trafficking. Human trafficking is slavery. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for this beautiful day, career, first to enjoy. We thank you for this opportunity to come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we lift up those who are being victimized by human trafficking. Though we do not know their names, but you do, for you watch over them. We pray that you bring them home safely. We thank you for ministries such as Hope Ranch, who rescue people from these horrible acts that just dehumanize everyone it touches. And we pray for those that are also in control of these things because they are victims of Satan's hand. We pray, Lord, that you will release them that you will convict them and that they will turn themselves in but at the same time become a light in the darkness because Lord you see everyone as they are help us children that need to be brought into the light and those of us who are already in you may we hear the Christ for help May we hear those that are in need, and may we open our eyes so we can see them and bring them to you, their Lord and Savior. We thank you that we can come together. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will be with us as we worship you this morning, Lord, and I pray that you bless the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. If you feel like you want to, you can stand up. If you don't, you can sit. I'm not bossy. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord Most High. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord Most High. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run. Most high, the name of the Lord is a 
strong tower, the righteous run into it, and they are saved. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run into it, and they are saved. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord. privilege to be able to come into the Lord's house and sing praises to him, giving thanks for all the things he's done for us. And uh, I don't know if this is time to come to the altar, but if you want to, it's open. the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy. on that day when my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever more bless the Lord oh my soul oh Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I will worship Your holy name. I will worship Your holy name. I will worship Your holy name. Jesus, Jesus. You 
are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus. Yesterday, I had the privilege of attending a funeral service, and you know, it's not unusual for my line of work, but anyway, I went to Cindy's mom's service, and I was so blessed. The pastor mentioned one of my favorite verses, which is, blessed in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, and I was like, that's so comforting to know because we are in God's hands no matter what happens to us, no matter where we are. God isn't surprised by anything, and he knew exactly when he needed to come home and be with him. And it was a very um, great blessing um, to my heart to be there and um, share in that glorious um, I don't know memorialization of a great lady who has gone on to her reward there's a whisper I can hear it when I'm quiet abide in me abide in me when I feel my troubles multiplying, abide in me, abide in me. I'll rest in you, Lord, to hear your voice changes everything. i 
Thank our worship team for their uh, faithful and wonderful leadership. Uh, you've noticed over the last uh, month or so that um, our worship team is like every other work team in America. It's uh, suffering some uh, consequences of people getting sick. Uh, we haven't had any COVID, fortunately, but um, I, I think probably nationwide we're, our resistance to just the ordinary cold has really plummeted because we have so much stress going on. And so when you see a, a spot like the drums um, not being filled, you just want to pray for that person and pray that God brings them back to us healthy as soon as we can. Um, but, in, but until then, uh, we're going to keep chugging along and having good worship services and uh, maybe sharing a little extra thank you for those who've been able to stay healthy and um, have picked up the load. Well, last week I was on vacation, and I just have to say, you know, it's great to be back. Uh, great to be back and to see all your faces. Now, to be honest, it was also great to be gone. <laughs> I mean, I just want to say, if I'm being honest, it was great to be gone. Um, we went, uh, Jan and I, our, our tradition is every uh, January 1st, that, that weekend or the weekend closest to it, we take all of our family uh, over to the coast. We get a big house and we just camp out and we enjoy loving on each other, having way too much food, sleeping in and uh, more loving on each other. And I think we have some pictures. This is right across the street from where our beach house was this year in Lincoln City. Um, fairly nice weather, great view of the ocean from, from every front window of the house. And the next picture is uh, Jan and me, our annual picture taken at Moe's. And then uh, my grandson and myself uh, down on the beach um, he was amazed when we went down to the beach and he actually found rocks down there. And he, <laughs> he thought that was great, and so I did too. Um, so uh, I listened to service. It seemed like it was a great service last week. I always um, enjoy Steve Hauser and his ability to talk not only in theory about how God works, but to have those stories in which he's seen God at work in his life. So in, in January, and spilling over a little bit into February, uh, we're going to do what I call James in January. Uh, no, it's not James Packnett who goes to our church, and it's not LeBron James, uh, although I know some of you are hoping that LeBron James has a great January. Um, but it's, uh, it's the book of James, uh, A Practical Faith. And every week we're going to look at uh, the, the next chapter. So today we're in chapter one. Next week we'll be in chapter two and, and so forth. And we just want to kind of dig out, you know, what are some really um, nitty gritty, practical, here's what you do, ways of living, not what it means uh, to follow Jesus. It's a good way to start the year. Um, and so before um, I dive in and uh, talk about what excites me about James, as I've been sharing this this week, 
uh, every person I shared it to had something about James they wanted to share with me. So what are some of the things you already know about the book of James? It's written by a man named James. There we go. That's, it's called James because that's who wrote it. Charlene. Yes, if you know to do right, but you do wrong anyway, that's a problem. Anybody else? Yes, uh, the James that wrote uh, the book that we'll be looking at for the next month was the biological brother of Jesus. So because of the people that he wrote to, the book of James, he deals a lot with how you handle and respond to the hard struggles in life. So it's very realistic. It starts off by saying, you've got trials. That's the second verse, I think. You've got trials. And uh, he gives a, a Christian perspective on what it means to be people who have trials. Anything else? Works that establish your faith? Yeah. Yeah. One of the famous quotes is, faith without works is dead. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth? Or wash your mouth. Oh, watch, watch, okay. Just wanted to make sure we had that right. Watch your mouth. Now, those of you who are teachers, it says especially, you need to be really careful because you're using a mouth a lot, and it kind of tends to run away from you. So no one's told me what I had heard three or four times this week about Martin Luther in the book of James. Martin Luther didn't like the book of James because it didn't talk about Jesus enough for him. And uh, we'll, we'll find that maybe, maybe he sold it, sold it short. Um, but the, it, it's one of those really unique books because it is very intensely practical in how you live out the Christian faith. Well, that's some of the things that we, we know. I just put up a, a screen here with kind of the overview. Um, he's a biological brother of Jesus. Now, uh, while Jesus was alive in his earthly ministry, James didn't think much of Jesus. Uh, he was just the little, little big brother. Um, but after Jesus died and was resurrected, he came back and he appeared specifically to James, his brother. And at that point, um, James was convinced. And, and what I want to say at that point is um, allow Jesus to give himself the opportunity to prove himself to you. If you're one of the ones that, that are doubting or seeking or kind of wondering about who Jesus is, is he really everything the church says? Allow Jesus to prove himself to you. He loves to do that, and he'll find ways to do that. Uh, James was known as Camel Knees, his nickname, because he spent so much time in prayer. Um, this man that was written a book that's intensely practical. Here are the how-do things. Here's what you do. Here's what you don't do. He's really known as well for the incredible time that he spent in prayer because prayer is one of the most practical things a person can do. Prayer changes things, and whatever changes things um, is, is getting pretty practical. He was martyred. He was killed probably by the governor, uh, government. Sometime between eighty sixty two and seventy, uh, which means that this book was probably written about eighty sixty, and it's written to other Jewish Christians, um, people who all their life had been Jewish, all their parents' life, their parents had been Jewish, going back, and they they could do this going back ten or fifteen or twenty generations. Everyone in their family had been Jewish. They'd been Jewish all their life. And then at, at age 30 or 40 or whatever, they had some kind of encounter with a Jesus follower, and they gave their life to, to Jesus. And so that's the kind of people we're looking with. That's not your story, probably, and certainly not my story, but that's the story of these people. They were, they were thoroughly Jewish, and they, in their mind, they had really culminated what that meant to be a Jewish person by following Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They are, he says, they're scattered. The Jewish people, by the time of uh, Jesus, 
uh, were not loc localized just in the area around Jerusalem, but they were all over uh, the Roman world. There were a million of them down in Egypt. There were probably at least 100,000 in Rome. Uh, they were in, uh, there's a lot of them in very different pockets of what's now Turkey. And so he's writing to encourage these people who had a lifelong connection with Judaism and with the Old Testament, but now had given themselves to Christ and wanted to know, you know, how do we live this out? It's not just something we want to think in our heads, but it's something we want to do with our hands and our feet. And the last thing I want to say before we, we dive this morning into our message is um, not intentionally on my part, although you think I was, I was pretty clever, uh, but really James is the New Testament version of the book of Leviticus. And if you're in the process of, of Immerse where we're meeting together uh, once a week and some of us in groups and studying um, through the Bible, right, this is the week that we're st getting started in Leviticus. And in a, in a lot of ways, James is the New Testament. Both of them are intensely practical. Um, you know, I heard this morning, uh, James kind of, I mean, Leviticus kind of goes overboard in saying precisely to do this and then do that and then to do that. And if you change it just a little bit, well, you do this and you do this and you do that. And over and over again, it kind of lays out, you know, how is it that you give a sacrifice? How is it that you respond to this problem? How do you deal with this sin? How do you cleanse yourself of this problem? Uh, very precise, uh, dealing with, you know, how does a person know that they're right with God and how do they act that out in the way that they treat other people? And James is the same thing, very practical, uh, very intense. And both of them are focused on cleansing. There's a whole lot of you got to cleanse this, you got to cleanse that, you got to cleanse the, the lamb, you got to cleanse its innards, you've got to cleanse uh, your house, you got to cleanse your body, you got to cleanse your, your um, clothes, and very detailed ideas of how you have to clean things in Leviticus. In the, the New Testament version doesn't talk so much about cleaning your clothes, although I encourage you to do that. But the New Testament version focuses on how do you clean your life and your soul and your personality? Both of them are concerned about cleaning because dirt is a problem, right? Dirt is a problem. Um, it's a problem because uh, on a physical level, um, dirt um, can cause infection, which at its worst can threaten your very ability to live. You know, we have the new house, and so I'm working in the new house, uh, cleaning up uh, dishes and such. And uh, one morning this week, I think like three times, I turned quickly to the left, and I banged my ankle on the dishwasher. The dishwasher lid was down. And never had that problem in the old house, uh, but I'm having to learn. And it's a good reminder, by the way, uh, every time now I step on my ankle, I'm, I'm remembering, oh, wait a minute, yes, we have a dishwasher that's just to the left of where I'm at the at the sink. Um, and so I went back into the bedroom and I found the thing was just bleeding all over the place. And the first thing I did was I cleaned it. I disinfected it. And then I put bandages on it to keep it clean because if I didn't, there could be dirt that would get in there and it could cause infection and it could cause all sorts of problems for me. And I just didn't want to have to worry with that. So on a preventive basis, I cleaned it. Well, dirt is a problem for the soul as well. For the same reason, actually, because um, exposure to dirt can work itself into our spirit in the same way that physical dirt works our itself into our body. It works itself into our spirit, and it can create an infection, a problem that, that threatens our, actually our spiritual life. For instance, we can accept things that God condemns, you can do that, not advisable, you can do that only so long, accepting what God condemns, only for so long before God himself becomes irrelevant to you. And that's just one example. All around us, and we'll look at here in just a minute at some more examples, but all around us there is spiritual dirt. And the book of James is just as um, opposed to spiritual dirt as the book of Leviticus is at physical dirt because he knows what happens if it, that 
phys- the spiritual dirt works itself into your soul, it can really mess things up. So let's look at James. And I think one of the very first things that, um, for me anyway, as I've been going through James and studying and reading about it and rereading the book and rereading the book, is I'm just, um, when I grew up, I, I was told, you know, uh, James is mad at Paul because Paul talks about how you're saved by faith. And James wanted to raise his hand and say, well, what about what you do? Isn't what you do important? And so I've always been told that, that James was the guy for, for action and doing stuff, and he really wasn't interested much in the faith end of things. And so I find very surprising that actually James believed in faith, that he thought faith was a good thing. Um, James 1.3, uh, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. It's a good thing. Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face many kinds of trials because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And having a good faith and a strong faith is important. Faith is good. Later on in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 5, he says, uh, become rich in faith. Well, you wouldn't want to say become rich in something you don't care about. Be rich in faith. And then, actually, the, the best picture of what's going on in James's mind and heart when he thinks about faith and action is uh, verse 22, ch- chapter 222, he says, faith and actions work together. So it's not that they're opposed to each other, that they're fighting each other. And it's really easy in our way of thinking to think, oh, there's this category of faith stuff, and there's this category of action stuff, and they're fighting each other to see who's going to have the preeminence. But the reality is, is James, as he sees them, he sees them so intertwined with each other that it's hard to imagine one being alive while the other one's dead because they're intertwined and they feed each other and it's the same life support system. Our, what we believe affects what we do, but also what we do affects what we believe. The healthiness of your actions grows with strong faith but also the healthiness of your faith grows with loving action. And so our our verse for the morning is from James 1, and it's verse 21. James 1, 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word of God planted in you, which can save you. So I just want to go kind of phrase by phrase through that that chapter, which um, really it's summing up a lot of things that happen later on in in the book as well. But he says, first of all, get rid of the moral filth. So here's the connection to Leviticus. The moral filth and the evil which is so prevalent. And so there's a couple things that are just part of the assumption that James has about what life is like as he thinks about it from a very practical dimension. And the first thing he thinks that he sees and that God is calling him to share through this book is, hey, there's evil all around you. There's evil all around you. So already we've had up on the platform, you know, our our lay pastor that leads us in in caring for others, uh, Stacy, saying, hey, you know, there's evil all around us. Trafficking, whether it's for for labor and for work or for... uh, uh, sexual favors. There's trafficking that goes all around us, and not just around us over in Cambodia, but in the United States, and not just in the United States, but in Oregon, and then she brought it down to, um, you know, almost like you say, well, it's not that far from us just physically, um, and, and Stacy can tell you stories within several blocks of our church where human trafficking happens. So when, when James says evil is prevalent, it's all around you, He's exactly speaking the truth. But there's a lot of other evil. That's one of the easy things to pick on because everyone that's not involved in human trafficking understands how despicable it is. But there are other things that maybe uh, are easier for us to accept as opposed to reject. Um, it bothers me that, that adultery, which um, the, the Bible and almost any other faith um, is so much opposed to because of the danger the infection it brings when we accept it. You know, it's either accepted just as normal or as funny, as good humor. It, it, it bothers me that, 
we live in a world where the idea is if everyone's doing something, then it must be right. No, everyone can do the wrong thing and we can enjoy doing the wrong thing. Most of the wrong things about life are fun to do. Uh, but they're wrong because although they're fun at the front end, have disastrous, infectious results at the back end. And so we don't want to have the infectious results at the back end, and so we say, let's not do the front end. Let's put the Band-Aid on. Let's put the disinfectant on. Let's get rid of that before it has a chance to come full circle and the impact that it has in our life. I, I see all the time, and I saw it this morning as I was going through um, the register guard, you know, the, the suggestion that taking care of yourself is the most important priority. More than anything else, you need to take care of yourself. And yet, um, Matthew 16, 4, 24, just one of probably 100 verses in the New Testament that have a different way of looking at life. Uh, rather than saying taking care of yourself is the most important, it says taking care of others is pretty important. Matthew 6, uh, 16.24. Jesus is talking to disciples and it's getting close to his crucifixion, which certainly was not taking care of himself um, in today's terms. And he says to his disciples, Matthew 16.24, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Take up your cross and follow me. Lose your life and that's how you find it. There is evil ever present all around us. That's the first thing that um, James is thinking of and that the, the Holy Spirit is inspiring him to, to share with us is, hey, we need to have the awareness and the consciousness that uh, there is evil all around us. And secondly, kind of flowing out of that, is we need to, we currently, most of us um, have moral filth that we need to get rid of. Now, he doesn't say, maybe sometime a friend of yours will have some moral filth and you need to show them how to clean up. He says, get rid of the moral filth you have. Well, and remember, he's not talking to horrible people. He's talking to people who've been nice Jewish people all their lives and are nice Jewish people who have also got Jesus in their life. And so he looks at these people in, in Africa and um, the Middle East and Turkey and Rome, and he says, he says, I know you because I know people. And I know you because I know Jewish people, and I know you because I know Jewish Christian people, and it, there's moral filth in your life, and you need to get rid of it. You can, and that's what the Holy Spirit's given to you, but, you know, you need to get rid of it. It's hard to live in the world, almost impossible. It's hard to live in the world without allowing some of the world to get into us. And I know some of you have already gone to, to John 17, where John... Jesus, as he's praying for his disciples, he says, God, I want them to be in the world. I want them to be relevant. I want them to be connected to people in the world. I want them to be in the world, but I don't want them to be of the world. I don't want them to, to absorb the moral lack of groundedness, of orientation to me. The, I don't want them to accept that selfishness and sinfulness. God, can you allow my people to be in the world, but not of the world? And here we're saying, you know, we're connected to people and we're in the world, but we're not allowing its moral filth to invade us. And so the assumption of this verse is we all need cleansing. Not because we're bad people, but because we live in a dirty world. In a dirty world. Uh, this is where Leviticus and James once again connect. We live in a dirty world, and so we just need to think, you know, on a regular basis, I need to get cleaned up. Every morning I take a shower, not because I'm a horrible person or because I did really filthy things the day before, uh, but simply because I live in a world where there's dirt that goes, and um, some of it sticks to me. And uh, all the other reasons that we take showers in the morning, but, but I do that. And I don't do it, and I don't, 
I don't wake up saying, well, I haven't done anything bad for the last days, so I just make that part of my process. And whether I need it or I don't, I know that I'm walking into my day um, physically clean. But I also take a spiritual shower every morning. I take a spiritual shower. I call it my devotions, where I allow the Word of God to cleanse me. This is what uh, Ephesians 5 says, that God's Word will cleanse you. So I allow myself to be cleansed by the Word of God. Um, I allow God, during my time of reading the Bible, to say, Mark, here's a little bit of moral filth you have. Can I clean that from you? And I say, oh, yes, Jesus. Would you clean that? Oh, I, I had the wrong attitude yesterday about my problems that I had. Or I had the, the wrong perspective on the things that I have. Or yesterday I just, I, I allowed myself to get angry when I should not have gotten angry. God, would you remove that from me and cleanse it from me? And so there is the assumption that we live in the evil world and at times some of the moral filth kind of sticks to us and so there needs to be a regular process of cleansing. And then the, the, the positive picture is that we can humbly accept the word of God planted in you. Um, James 1.21, humbly accept. So having taken off the moral filth, we put on... Um, the, the Word of God, and it's planted in us. It's kind of an interesting picture, planted in us. Accept the Word of God. Accept the Word of God planted in you. Our faith, in our free Methodist world, and for us as Living Hope Church, our faith is based on the Bible. It's based on the Bible because the Bible is bigger and stronger than any one person. I may have my own personal persuasions, and they don't always agree with the Bible, and I have a I have this conversation with God about that. I said, God, your Bible's a little bit wrong because I see things differently. And God just smiles gently and um, continues to persevere. And eventually I catch up. But the Bible is bigger and it's stronger than any of us individually. The Bible challenges me when I'm wrong. And there's times when I'm wrong and I need to be challenged. And um, the Bible will do that. Sometimes Sunday, or sometimes during the morning when I'm having devotions, other times when I'm hearing a good sermon or uh, when I'm sitting in a Sunday school class, the Bible challenges me when my thinking is wrong. It also comforts me when my feelings are out of whack, when I'm hurting, when I'm wondering, when I'm feeling defeated. The, the Word of God will come in and it will comfort me because it's bigger and it's stronger and it puts me in touch with all of that God has in store for me. The Word of God, the Bible, guides me when I'm clueless. And that's quite a bit of the time. You know, when, when we're clueless, when we don't know how to do, or when we're wondering if we're doing the right thing, or we want to make sure that we're investing our time or our finances wisely, you know, the Word of God with the Spirit of God can come and it gives us guidance and it gives us confidence for our future. Our faith is based on the Bible. And faith by the way, it says it's something that we receive. Salvation is something that we receive. Um, receive the word of God. Receive, humbly accept the phrase. Humbly accept the word of God planted in you. Um, so faith is not something that I build or something that I develop um, or, or something that I earn. It's a gift from God. God says planted it in our souls. And I read all of the experts about James about the Bible. No one has a clue about what that really means outside of the fact that it's God initiated. God does something to us and he puts his truth into us and then he gives us the opportunity either to turn away from that or to humbly accept it. God planted it in our souls and God makes it effective at that point when we say, yes, Jesus, I receive. What you've given to me, I receive. Um, earlier in chapter 1, verse 12, it says, you know, you can receive the crown of life. You can receive it. We don't earn it. We don't win it in the lottery. Oh, I, you know, I, I won going to heaven. You know, there were, it was one out of a 10 million chance, and I was the one out of 10 million. No, we, we receive it, and everyone that wants to receive it does. Now, we need to do good works, and most of our looking at James will talk about 
the good works that we need to do and the bad works that we need to avoid. We need to good, do good works, but not in order to get salvation, but as a response, as a proof, as a demonstration of the change that God has made in our life. If there's a change that's made in our souls, then it will work itself out as a change in the way that we treat other people and we treat ourselves. And the last little phrase that says, uh, which can save your souls? Which can save your souls? And, uh, you know, if you spend much time listening to the sermons, you know that uh, when James and the rest of the New Testament was written, it wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek, in old-fashioned Greek at that. And sometimes when you translate from one language to another, it's really hard to find the right word. And so people do the best they can. And this is one of the times when I think they absolutely failed us. I don't know how they would do it better, but that word where it says, you know, um, the word of God, which God planted in your soul, can save your soul. The word can, the Greek word for that is actually dynamite. It's dunamis. It's dynamite. And you know what dynamite is. It's not a, well, it might happen, it can't happen. It's the explosive power to overcome any resistance. The explosive power to overcome any resistance. This word it says can, it says that is an incredible power to overcome any resistance that would stand in the way of your salvation. When you say, yes, Jesus, I receive your word, that unleashes the power of God. There's nothing that you can do to change your soul because we have to receive it. We don't earn it. We don't develop it. We don't build it. We don't think about it. We just receive it. There's nothing that we can do to change our soul, but there's nothing that keeps God from changing our soul except our own refusal to accept the change. Now, this connection of the word of God and the gospel of salvation also comes to us in Ephesians. And uh, because James and is often seen as being angry at Paul. I love all the ways in which he actually reflects Paul's thinking. Ephesians 1.13 says, You were included in Christ at that point, included in Christ at that point, when you heard the message of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked with him with a seal. We receive God's salvation when we respond positively to the word which he has planted within us. It says he saves our soul, and that raises the, the good question, well, what does he save us from? Well, he, most of us in this room would say, you know, obviously he, when we're talking about salvation, he saves us from spiritual death. He regenerates us. Ephesians 2 says, you know, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and he made us alive again. He made us alive spiritually through this gift of salvation which we receive when we take in the word of God. But that's not just the spiritual death. In terms of the verse, it says it's the spiritual dirt, the moral filth. Get rid of the moral filth. How do we do that? By receiving the word of God, which is able to save us not only from spiritual death, but also from spiritual dirt, from spiritual filth, from, from uh, dismay and, and decay. And as I was thinking about it and praying over this yesterday, uh, you know, there's so many other things that it saves us from. And one of the things that the Spirit of God saves us from is self-condemnation. Um, one of the, the more famous preachers in the 1970s and 80s um, loved to talk about all the things that God wants to do for you. And um, he inspired people to think big thoughts, and he loved to inspire people to think big thoughts. And he says, I know when you have a big thought, the problem is, is people are going to put you down. Because someone that has a dream, someone that has a vision, someone that has a, a big idea of what they can do, they're going to find that they produce resistance from people who don't want to catch up to them. But he says, you need to know that for all the outside people that might oppose your ideas, no one has opposed more of your good, good ideas than you have yourself. No one um, is more self-critical of who you are than you are of yourself. Now, some of you don't have this problem. Um, you, you are wonderfully um, in love with yourself and appropriately accepting of who you are. But there's, I know there's a lot of you 
There's a lot of us that we are more critical of ourselves than anyone else would ever be. And we are more critical of our ideas. And we tend to discard our ideas, not because they're bad, but because they're ours. If this is my idea, it must be bad. You know, if this is my work, it must be inferior. If this is my goal, it must be inadequate and selfish. And one of the things that Jesus saves us from is he saves us from self-condemnation. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Now, we need to get rid of the moral filth. This is not an excuse to do sinful things, but it is an invitation to accept the forgiveness and the cleansing and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I think sometimes it's hard for us to, um, to accept ourselves because we know of all the bad things that we've done. Some of them are pretty bad. Some of them are pretty bad. Uh, more than that, uh, speaking from personal experience, um, it's not so much the bad things I've done, but it's all the bad things I thought about doing. It's a little bit hard to accept myself to say, you wouldn't think I was such a wonderful person if you knew that the, the 14 things I wanted to do yesterday but somehow didn't do. I'm glad I didn't, but I wanted to do them, and I thought about it, and I even thought about ways that I could do it and get away with it. Self-condemnation. Jesus says, I make you worthy of love. I make you worthy of my love. I make you worthy of acceptance, but I also make you worthy of your own acceptance. You can't make yourself acceptable, much less lovable, but that's what Jesus is for. One of the things, he saves us from spiritual death. He saves us from spiritual dirt, but he also saves us from that self-condemnation which robs us of investing ourselves in other people and in the work that God wants us to do in the world. So is faith practical? And it felt kind of strange talk, starting off a, a sermon series where we we're looking at the very practical things and say, well, you need to believe in the Bible. But on the other hand, I can't think of anything more practical than the call to prayer and the call to live our life by receiving the word of God implanted into us. It's about as practical as you get. It's saying that when God offers you grace, you accept it. That's practical. That's doing something. That when, um, we, when we tell God what our needs are, God provides. When we ask God for direction, God guides. When we offer God our soul, we say, God, here I am, take me, I belong to you. He takes us and he transforms us. And so I just encourage you, along with our friend James, that you humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Let's pray. And our worship team has, I think, some more time in worship and music for us. God, we look forward to, to digging into James and uh, some of us individually in our homes and then together on, on Sunday morning as we, we look at the, the wisdom and the advice and the instruction um, that allows us to live uh, lives of joy in the midst of tough times. And uh, we, we look at if at those first couple of verses, it says, if you have all sorts of trials, give joy. And we go, you know, hey, in COVID times, we're going through all sorts of trials. In addition to all the COVID stuff, there are so many other problems that, that we're facing, uh, financial problems, family problems, just problems of what it means to grow up and, or grow in our faith, um, questions we have about um, our careers and our jobs, um, Lord, so many of the things around us just seem to be falling apart, the physical things, and we wonder how to take care of them and whether to replace them. So many questions, so many problems, so many trials. And so we need to have your practical instruction, and we look forward to this. We want to receive it. We want to accept it. God, give us a faith big enough to say that for whatever needs we have, that you have um, a direction, you have a provision, you have the wisdom and the encouragement. God, make us people 
who are uh, so aware of the fact that we, we live in a morally filthy world the way the world has always been. We live in a morally filthy world, and so regularly we need to come to you for, for spiritual clean cleansing. Just asking that your word to identify and to remove those things which are true about us, but we don't want to be true. Which are true about us, but don't reflect your grace and your truth and your love. And then, Lord, may there be that sense of faith to say that as we come before you and lay ourselves out before you, that you take all that we are and you transform it and you make it something beautiful. May we give you joy and we may we give you praise for the way that you interact with us that you intersect us, that you intertwine with us in a way that all of your life flows into the dead spots of our life and gives us life as well. And as you do, we will give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. mountain top looking just how far we've come knowing that for every step you were with us kneeling on this battleground seeing just how much you've done knowing every victory was your power in us scars and struggles on the way but with joy hearts can say Never once did we ever walk alone Never once did you leave us on our own You are faithful God you are faithful Kneeling on this battleground victory was your power in us scars and struggles on the way but with joy our hearts can say yes our hearts can say through a day without you. We're so grateful that you've met with us here today. And uh, we just want to, I don't know, send our souls up to you in praise.
for spending your Sunday morning with us, whether it's here in the room or uh, through the camera and through the internet on Facebook. Uh, looking forward to seeing you um, again, how Christ brings us together. Um, just a reminder, that we've got uh, uh, the little spots in the back, uh, the buckets, the containers for your checks, if you brought a check today for your um, tithe. Um, certainly, we're willing to take those through the internet or through the mail as well. Uh, let's pray, and then you'll be dismissed. 
God, we are grateful for all the ways that you come to us. We're thankful for the fact that you come to us and you plant uh, the possibilities of what you want to do in our heart, and then you give us the freedom to respond. Uh, Lord, this morning we've responded with enthusiasm, with joy. Um, when we think of all that you've done and all that you sacrificed for us, we just want to say how great thou art. Now, take our offerings, our financial offerings, our time offerings, our offering of ourselves and our obedience, and make it um, a wonderful thing to you and a blessing to the world around us. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.